have a lot of news coming out of the Middle East to get to. The region is on edge. The United States sent a top military commander to Israel because of what is considered an imminent threat of retaliation from Iran against Israel. I'm not going to speak to what Iran may or may not do or what our assessments are. You don't need an intelligence community assessment to, to see the threats that Iran has been making. They've been making those threats quite publicly and quite loudly over the, the past few days. So we will continue to send the message to them that it is not in their interest to escalate this conflict and it's not in the region's broader interest and we hope other partners will send that same message. Iranian leaders have said that they will punish Israel for an attack on Syria at the beginning of this month that killed senior Iranian commanders. Per the New York Times, American General Michael Carrilla will coordinate with Israel on what is expected to be retaliation by Iran. They will also discuss the war in Gaza and humanitarian aid getting sent into Palestine. So, Jessica, what did you make of uh, that answer there about Iran? Do you think that the United States is right to help Israel with countering Iran? Um, Iran has been, of course, behind the recent or has been funneling money, at least, to the Houthis who have been attacking shipping lanes in the South China Sea. They've also been threatening to attack Israel directly for quite some time now. Uh, where, where do you fall kind of on this sort of Israel versus Iran uh, situation? Yeah, it just makes perfect sense to me, Amber, that we send, you know, a U.S. military official that's very high profile into the biggest conflict zone in the world. What could possibly go wrong? I don't know. It makes perfect sense to me. They're de definitely just there to say, Iran, don't do this. We may have funded Israel for everything they've done in Gaza, and that's why you're very upset with us. But now there's U.S. military official there. So if you want to mess with them, you have to mess with us. This is an escalation of the conflict. It's it's just absolutely mind numbing. It's obviously intentional that they want to send, you know, a U.S. military official into the Middle East, into Israel. And we don't even know if it's merited to say that what's going on with Iran, that there actually is some kind of imminent attack. We we have no idea. The, the United States government has a history of telling us intelligence that's based on no facts whatsoever, but it is very convenient for their political narrative and their excuses and the path that they want to take in a particular conflict. I'm extremely skeptical of this course of action. Uh, it's just ridiculous, almost unthinkable to say, you know, we don't tell Israel what to do. We're not involved in this conflict. They're an ally and we'll support them with aid. But then, you know, just come up with an excuse. Maybe it's real, right? Let's say maybe it is absolute, you know, fact and they're 100 percent certain that there's an attack intimate from Iran. What will sending a U.S. military official there do? Is it some kind of deterrence? Are they going to strategically help them avoid the attack? It just it really seems like an act of escalation and it's not going to bring this conflict to a close any sooner. It definitely seems uh, like a, a bit of irony that the Biden administration early on uh, in its in its time in power was really trying to open up relations with Iran, was trying to be very friendly with them. They, of course, uh, released this, I believe, it was six billion dollars in exchange for some hostages that had been seized previously under a sanctions policy. And they claim, don't worry, guys, the money is going to go to humanitarian assistance. It's earmarked for that as if money's not fungible, as if Iran wouldn't have used the $6 billion that was freed up um, to take money elsewhere and use it to continue their sort of picking around the world at trying to incite conflict. And now that the obvious has happened, the Biden administration is turning around and saying, well, now we have to counter Iran. Now we have to make sure that we have officials going to the Middle East to keep the peace because they've done such a great job of that so far. It's, it's just a classic case of someone reaping the consequences of their own actions and just being shocked when the dog bites them. Right. It's like watching a bar fight among people who are too drunk to make any real sense. It's like you have Israel, you know, with a, a lot more strength than Gaza, just really going at it. And then the idea that some guy, this would be Iran, stands up to Israel and says, hey, I don't think I, I like what you're doing to this guy. Leave him alone. You're much stronger than him. And then the United States, who is the strong guy's personal trainer, will say, giving them all of their strength. They step in and say, what do you think you're doing, Iran? You're way out of line. It's just a ridiculous course of action to try and make Iran seem like the big bad guys when they're retaliating against Israel, who is just causing widespread famine in Gaza. We'll get to that in a second. Has killed 30,000 people. It just, it's a very irrational course of action that's just 
giving drunk people outside of a bar. But this is international politics in 2024. I want to get back to the situation in Gaza. Now, U.S. aid administrator Samantha Power said earlier this week, it is, quote, credible to assess that famine is already occurring in parts of Gaza amidst the war between Israel and Hamas. Now, Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke on humanitarian aid in Gaza this week, saying, quote, Israel has made important commitments to significantly increase the supply of humanitarian assistance throughout Gaza. But what matters is results and sustained results. And this is what we will be looking at very carefully in the days ahead. It feels that time and again, it's, you know, we're looking for things. We're paying attention to it. It's the classic, we see you, we hear you, but without a commitment for for action for the people in Gaza, they seemingly are okay with letting people starve. Uh, We have heard from UN agencies and humanitarian agencies that widespread famine has been the case in Gaza, you know, with varying standards of what qualifies as famine, people eating grass, people drinking water not safe for animals, Uh, The blockade on any aid or assistance coming into Gaza has been in place since just after October 7th. So this idea that this famine is somehow new and we're going to look into it and make sure things get better, it's just empty words at this point. And it's really making the United States a huge target on the global stage. Amber, what's your reaction to all of that? Yeah, I can't recall if we talked about this last week or if it was me and Bree, but we talked about, of course, the Biden administration. Well, President Biden himself now calling for a ceasefire without conditioning the release of hostages. But it looks like the talks have already stalled this week after the IDF assassinated three of the sons of Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh and the Hamas announcement that it does not have 40 hostages to release in a temporary ceasefire deal with Israel If true, the admission raises questions over how many Israelis that were kidnapped kidnapped on October 7th are still alive. Um, So on both sides here, you have these complicating factors, right? On Hamas' side, you have the problem with uh, whether or not they have potentially killed some of these hostages, and that's obviously going to anger Israel and make them even less likely to support a ceasefire. And then on the opposite side, Israel killing the sons of the Hamas leader they're not going to be interested in negotiating if that type of force continues, if the uh, if the aid situation in Gaza continues. And the Biden administration has sort of hinted at a policy change, Jess, but they haven't been really clear on what that means. I think a lot of people suspected that it meant pulling aid, but yet Congress and the White House are still lobbying for sending more money to Israel, sending more weapons to Israel. Um, so, I mean, what did you make of the Biden administration's statement? What did you make of the talks for the ceasefire being put on pause yet again? And do you think that Biden will eventually try to strong arm Israel into coming to the table in good faith? I saw this past week Elizabeth Warren say that she does believe what's going on in in Gaza perpetrated by Israel is genocide. And to see the Biden administration stray far away from someone who, yes, was in the progressive wing of of the party, but, you know, progressive policies did in part deliver him the presidency, but also someone who fell right in line when the Democratic Party needed it uh, behind Biden's, you know, candidacy for president within the primary. This was a candidate that people at the beginning of the race were saying, oh, I'm between Bernie and Elizabeth Warren, which there were policy differences. But in the current political landscape, they seemed very far left of of what we were getting from the Democratic Party. But then, of course, you know, she is a darling of the Democratic Party. She fell right in line. And to see what she's describing happening in the Middle East as so different from the Biden administration, I think reveals to me how far the Biden administration has strayed away from a, a hopeful trend I think some people were seeing come out of U.S. foreign policy, come out of the State Department, whether we're thinking of you know, the official State Department under the Secretary of State, or if we're thinking about USAID and the National Endowment for Democracy and all these other agencies that are hugely important for our work abroad. And there was this trend that was after the genocide in Rwanda, that we would never let something like this happen again. And you'll talk to people. I've talked to people uh, who were, you know, at the head of USAID in the Clinton administration. And the biggest regret for so many of these people whose career is making good foreign policy and and statecraft and diplomacy, their biggest regret of their career, and they, they, some of them say the half of a century since Vietnam is not 
getting more involved in the genocide in Rwanda and stopping it, and that they will never let this happen again. And to have it unfold with Israel, with some of the, the same language being used by you know the perpetrators and having some of the same actions taken by the perpetrators. And sometimes it's more egregious and at a much larger scale. I mean, the genocide in Rwanda between the, the, uh, the Tutsis and the Hutus, it was like you had people fighting with farm equipment. Now you have people fighting with rockets and bombs and missile fire and chemical weapons. And so it's almost worse in this case, but for some reason, we think evil is something that looks like someone with a farm tool, someone that has darker skin, someone who is dirtier, rather than someone who's well-spoken with a nice smile, a suit, and an army to command, that that somehow is less evil or can't be just as evil. And that's really what I think we're going to grapple with for quite some time and people working within the Biden administration now will really regret being a part of and allowing this to happen. And Bill Clinton himself said that he regretted not getting involved in the in the genocide. Uh, when I was at Georgetown, he came to campus and gave a speech, and a student asked him about it, and he said that that was one of his biggest regrets while being in office. So uh, I think you're right that there's a lot of people from that time period that definitely feel like they didn't handle that properly. We're going to leave it there. We'll be back. More rising after this.